We're very fortunate today to have Dave Demeray speaking to us. Dave got his PhD in geochemistry from Indiana University and has spent uh, his career working on the biogeochemical carbon cycle and the early evolution of Earth and its biosphere. Um, Dave's particular focus in these studies have been ancient carbonates and organic matter, microbes in extreme environments, and isotope geochemistry of carbon in meteorites, lunar sample, and oceanic basalts. Dave serves on the editorial board of two journals, Astrobiology and Geobiology, and is the PI of NASA Ames Astrobiology node. And he's also recently been named chair of MEPAG, the Mars Exploration Program Assessment Group. Analysis. Analysis Group. And today Dave will, will um, discuss for us exploring Mars for evidence of habitable environments and life. Dave. Thank you. <coughs> well, I've restructured the talk that I normally give to uh, emphasize more uh, the structure of the Mars program because uh, in addition to sharing some interesting uh, observations with you, many of which you probably have already heard, but some maybe not, uh, also to give a context for where we see the program going in the future. And of course, all of this very much related to the topic, uh, the title of the talk, Exploring for Evidence of Habitable Environments in Life. And of course, the first uh, slide here shows images that are, um, you know, particularly relevant to the, uh, to the subject, and that is probably more than any other planet in our solar system, Mars has had a history of its environment that is most similar to that of the Earth. Obviously not identical, as evidenced by the way Mars looks today, but certainly potential that it was more similar to the Earth in the past, and in any case, more similar overall to Earth than any other object in the solar system. And of course, with that carries the implication that life might have, have developed or at least uh, sustained itself there at some time in the past. And of course, you know, during the century, during the 20th century, we went sort of through a valley of the shadow of doubt about Mars and life, and that is that, you know, we had, uh, you know, the uh, fantastic stories of aliens on Mars uh, around 1900 that sort of uh, went slowly away as we got better astronomical observations that most principally showed that the pressure of the Martian atmosphere was a lot less than what we would have expected for having intelligent civilizations there. And I would say the nadir of our excitement about uh, Mars was maybe in the late 60s, early 70s, when the first uh, spacecraft flew by and, and showed a cratered, apparently sort of lifeless looking surface. Uh, but the whole point of this slide and everything that's going to follow is that the stock market on this has gone back up considerably since the early 70s. And the, Viking, and the observation, early uh, observations confirmed by Viking, of course, of these large channels coursing across the surface indicated that there was a climatic regime a long ago that was really quite different from what it is today. So this speaks to sort of large system level changes in Mars. Changes in, of course, the hydrologic cycle, changes in the, in the tectonics and other aspects of Mars that would have sustained such a hydrologic cycle, and potentially also changes in the nature of any Martian biosphere if it were there. And it gave rise to sort of this really a working hypothesis, or actually, that uh, the conditions that might have sustained life on Mars have really changed over its history from four and a half billion years ago to today. If the blue sort of represents a locus of environments that might have been habitable, the notion is that near surface or surface environments might have been habitable within the first few hundred million years of Mars history, but as the climate deteriorated over time, as evidenced by what Vikings saw at the surface uh, during that mission, uh, water would really only be stable at a sufficient uh, depth to where pressure and temperature would have permitted it to be stable. And so the hypothesis is that if you want to look for evidence of habitable environments and life on Mars, either today you go drilling down a couple of three kilometers into the subsurface, or you explore in the di distant geologic past for evidence that might have been retained about the environment or about uh, life itself. <coughs> um, and really, to explore that uh, model and to really explore Mars as a system, the Mars Exploration Program, which was really formally uh, organized in the latter part of the 20th century, of course, uh, established some major goals uh, for the program. And the key point is that this is an interdisciplinary program. To really address the life question, which as you see is the first and foremost of the goals, you really need to understand 
uh, several of the other goals as well because it's a system, a planetary system really, that supports a habitable environment which in turn then sustains life. So the major goals then are determine if life ever arose on Mars. Underneath that there are various objectives dealing with past life, with extant life, of course prebiotic chemistry, and then of course any, the long-term story of evolution of Mars that really bears on, on these questions here. The second one obviously related to water is the understanding the processes and history of climate on Mars. Uh, as I mentioned, this obviously has changed over time and is centrally important to life. And then determining the evolution of the surface and interior Mars, so that's the solid Earth. How does that relate to the overall story of, of the history of Mars? And of course the notion of preparing for human exploration. A lot of the questions that we ask here about Mars' ability to sustain life in the past are going to be relevant in terms of the resources available for future human exploration. And so these really represent then an integrated attempt to uh, explore Mars in the broadest context. And of course this then is overlaying on what I like to refer to as the heartbeat of the Mars exploration program. The heartbeat has a pulse of one, uh, you know, once every 25 months in the sense that every 25 months or so we have an optimal opportunity to launch spacecraft to Mars to maximize the payload and capability, taking advantage of the celestial mechanics, such that 2001, 2003, 3, 5, 7, and so forth, nine were missing for budgetary reasons, uh, really represents sort of how the structure within which we plan uh, this program. <clears throat> so that's point number one. Point number two which was actually something that was laid out in the exobiology strategy for Mars exploration in the mid-90s, is that we should proceed in, in several stages of exploration. First, you do a global reconnaissance of Mars by the use of orbiters to give a more of an overall context of Mars to address the critical question of, you know, what can we learn about the evolution of the Martian crust and, for that matter, the subsurface based on orbital documentation. And then secondly, how do we select landing sites, which now becomes the second major aspect of Mars exploration, based on the orbital observations. Uh, and then in, in, into the future, eventually we think in terms of sample return, uh, which amongst these landing sites that we determine either from orbit or from landers would be the best place to return a sample to Mars. And then of course beyond that, the whole pathway to human exploration. So this is sort of the broad context, but this sets very much the um, context for what I'll present to you in this talk. And one of the key things to mention about this is that there's an iteration process. And that is, as our orbital observations get better, our ability to select landing sites gets better, and we're able to address more effectively questions about where were the habitable environments, where would we really want to look for evidence of life. And of course, the real keystone to that is which samples would we bring back to Earth to really try to conclusively establish this life question. So what I, the, the, how I'm going to present this, uh, what we have found, is really in the context of how these measurements have improved over time, they've improved our understanding of the surface, and then also how the surface exploration has proceeded. Uh, and then, of course, related to that, and I really almost view this as the poster child map for the modern phase, the truly up, you know, current phase of Mars exploration, and that is the really excellent imagery uh, that Mars Global Surveyor began to provide in 1996 and most importantly the MOA which is the Mars Observer Laser Altimeter which flew on that mission gave us really good elevation control of the surface of Mars and now for the first time we can really say a lot about the morph geomorphologic surface of Mars here's the northern lowlands the southern highlands but mapped at a, at a resolution on the order of just a meter or so few meters as opposed to kilometer scale vertical resolution that was available through the Viking imagery. So just the major improvement by the MOLA map uh, that flew on MGS 1996 uh, mission uh, gives us a much more detailed view of the surface of Mars and therefore allows us to address some of the key questions about uh, you know where we might want to put, put down landing sites. And so again here's the, there's this what we call the global dichotomy of Mars. We have the northern lowlands and the southern highlands. You could think of this as perhaps analogous to the ocean basins on the Earth and the continents on the Earth, another sort of global dichotomy with respect to the surface elevation. Obviously, large craters showing up as, as, as negative features on that elevation map, uh, the highest places being the major volcanoes of Tharsis and Olympus Mons over here, and another major volcano up here as well, uh, basically giving you a sense 
not only of just the, the major uh, geologic provinces, but also to provide a context for any, any water features that might uh, exist here. And, I, and I'll, as I go through this talk, I'll show how our understanding of these water features has improved based on the improved observation capabilities. So basically, the other key thing I want to mention is that the southern highlands, by virtue of these in dense craters that you see, represent a much older surface than the northern lowlands. And again, harking back to that earlier theme of the early part of Mars is very interesting with respect to having more water activity. The most ancient crust of Mars gives us our best chance to find a preserved record of whatever the heck was going on back at that time. So you combine basically the desire to go to these older terrains, which are at higher elevation, against the need to land safely on the surface of Mars, which means you need more atmosphere uh, to slow down the spacecraft. So we're constantly in this tension between wanting to go to the older places, but at the same time to be have, a, have enough atmosphere to land safely on the surface. But I'll get back to that uh, point again later. But here is just a graphic example now of how this improved imagery uh, from the MGS in 1996 versus the Viking images in 1976 have really uh, begun to reveal a little bit more about the details of the aqueous history of Mars. Here are some valley networks that Michael Carr and others documented from the Viking imagery and at that time it gave rise to this notion that, the, that these channels were very sparsely spaced that they tended to end abruptly it's causing some to propose that there were springs that were feeding these channels uh, in other words, a, a, a picture of Mars that was obviously much drier and maybe more austere for life than uh, Earth is and that a, really a different kind of hydrology compared to what's most typically seen on the Earth. But this now just shows, this is the same place, I should say, this is the same location as this, but just with the superior elevation control, we can now begin to realize that this is actually a much more integrated and uh, uh, extensive uh, system of drainage features than what we had seen uh, were able to see with the Viking imagery and so just the improvement in the uh, vertical control has told us that these stream channels are more pervasive and therefore more consistent with precipitation as the source of the water as opposed to groundwater coming up from the subsurface so this is an example of how the improved imagery has really helped also places like Gusev crater uh, which is right at the boundary between the southern highlands and the northern lowlands, uh, has this major channel going into it. Now, we knew about this channel for some time, but people like Natalie Cambrol here at SETI Institute and others documented and studied a lot about the drainage basin of Maadim Vallis and were able to show how extensive it was and therefore how important this channel really was in feeding water into Gusev Crater. That plus the uh, analysis of Gusev itself laid, made us realize that this might be a great place to send a lander based on that geomorphologic analysis. You can see it's a pretty big crater, 180 meters in diameter, and of course that's where we sent the Spirit rover. But the other thing about the modern phase of Mars exploration that really added something qualitatively beyond the Viking era was the ability now to do mineral, mineral identifications from orbit. And the first really spectacular example of this was the discovery of what we call coarse grain hematite. Uh, that's an iron oxide but significantly, the coarse grain stuff, which is the gray hematite, and I just showed you some pictures of it here. Even knickknacks are made out of it, as you can see over there. Nice little pendant that you can buy. Probably not cheap either. Uh, but that nice gray color represents the coarse grained nature of this particular hematite, which on Earth is typically due to the interaction with liquid water. There's one example where you don't need liquid water, but most examples of how you form this gray hematite on Earth involve liquid water. This shows an observation, this is a Mercator projection of the entire Martian surface again, well maybe not quite up to the poles, but it's by the test, the thermal emission spectrometer on the Mars Global Surveyor mission, found very high concentrations of this coarse grain hematite right in the Meridiani area. And, and you can see the warmer colors again indicating a, a fair abundance of it. This blue indicates uh, basically below the detection limit. And so this immediately caused attention to be drawn to the Meridiani area, and of course that ended up being selected as the site for Opportunity Rover. So this shows how the imagery from the Mars Global Surveyor really paid off to select it, intelligently select two sites for the Mir mission. So again, this initial cycle of exploration where you do the orbital reconnaissance, site selection, and landing uh, playing out as, as shown here to great benefit. And here now are the landing sites for missions that we've done to the surface. 
Viking 1 and 2 you can see being sent to lower elevations for safety in the entry, descent, and landing. Uh, and likewise Pathfinder. And even here when we're really trying to be more aggressive about getting into the Southern Highlands, we're pr still pretty much limited to something on the order of minus two kilometers on the overall global elevation scale here uh, to uh, where we put opportunity in spirit. But we were able to put opportunity where we found that hematite and spirit was plopped right down in Gusev Crater. So we sort of followed the water and that was the key thing I should have said earlier, the, that the theme of the mission of this, of this program over the last decade has been to follow the water as a common theme for searching for life, search, uh, understanding the climate of Mars, and understanding the geologic history. So these were very much follow the water missions to really try to assess the extent to which liquid water played a role in the, in the evolution of these two landing sites. And of course, the, this shows the evolution of sorts from the little uh, uh, Sojourner uh, rover um, that was used in the Pathfinder mission. This is actually Marie Curie, the twin sister of Sojourner. Uh, and then, of course, the two Mars rovers. This happens to be Opportunity, and this happens to be Spirit over here, right at, they were at, at final assembly uh, when they were sort of extending or contracting the, uh, you know, the assembly uh, as it was being prepared for packaging uh, in, on top of the rocket. But in any case, uh, the lessons we learned from this first rover in terms of the type of instrumentation, the strategies for exploration, and the need really to have more range, indicated of course by the larger size of these rovers, really had a lot to do with the success of this particular mission. So even just within the lander uh, part of the Mars program, there's an evolution from one lander to the next that improves the power of performing scientific observation. And of course, these are really robotic field geologists. They have many of the attributes that a field geologist would have going out and doing the investigations. And of course, just to get briefly into uh, the observations that were made with these two rovers, uh, the first big news, of course, that hit after we landed, and we had to sort of sit on that secret for a couple, three months until we really had the story straight, was the evidence for water that was provided by uh, Opportunity at the uh, Meridiani landing site. The, first of all, these little tiny spheres that you see in this inset here, this is a, a place where the rover track uh, disturbed the surface. You can get a sense for the scale here, several centimeters across. These little tiny spheres, which are on the order of millimeter scale, um, were actually what we call in, um, uh, hematite spheres that were, we think formed uh, in a liquid, uh, like in a sediment that's saturated in water. And these things were just literally carpeting the surface of this area here, and they were the source of that signal we saw from orbit. This very high gray hematite signature turned out to be due to this just carpeting of the surface by these little tiny marbly things uh, all, all scattered around. But what, it's this outcrop here that really uh, presented the initial big payoff and that's shown here in the next slide, and that is, here again you see all those little gray pebbles all over the surface, little spheres, but here now is the outcrop that got us just instantly excited as soon as we turned on the cameras. It's not very big, it's only about half a meter. In fact, the rover could straddle this entire outcrop, but this is not lava rock. This is not volcanic basalt, which we know is dominant on the surface of Mars, that dominates the Martian crust. This was clearly not a volcanic rock, just the color of it indicates to you that it's something different, and also the very fine lamination here indicating that it's consistent with some kind of a sedimentary deposition. And of course what it turned out to be were these deposits very rich in sulfate, which of course is exciting because this much sulfate pretty much requires water to be mobilized and concentrated in a rock deposit like this. So abundant sulfate, the hematite rich, these little tiny spheres turned out to be embedded in this bedrock. And so they really were part of the story about where this bedrock was coming from. And as this bedrock was eroding down over time, these little spheres would become concentrated in what we call a lag deposit at the surface of this uh, landscape here. Uh, and also a bunch of other features here, which I'll uh, get into more in the next slide. And this now illustrates, I think, another very important point I want to make, and that is different scales of observation. If you're going to explore a place like Mars, you want to observe it at, a, at an orbital scale, a, a regional scale. You want to observe it at the scale that you and I would have as we walk around and look at the rocks and make inferences based on what we can just see with our own eyes. And then to get up close with a magnifying glass or a microscope to really get into more of the details of what really went on in the deposition of this rock. Here we see the little hematite spheres, which actually were embedded in the rock. 
and you can see a, a linear feature that goes right across this through the bedding, through that, and then right on indicating that this actually formed inside the sediment at some point in the past, consistent with a deposition from a fluid in a water-soaked sediment. We see evidence of other crystals that were here that have now been dissolved away. So again, evidence of a soluble mineral that was first in place and then later dissolved. But for, for us, one of the most exciting observations besides you know, the sulfate and, and all of this were these little ripple crest features indicating that this at one time was a sand at the surface that was underwater and that this water was being driven around by wind, by wind such as it, it, it's a proof that we had standing water at the surface of Mars. Now you cannot have standing water at the surface of Mars today. It's not stable. So the presence of these features indicates that there was standing water <coughs> at the surface of Mars that was being moved around by the wind and causing these ripple features like you would see on a beach or in a stream where you have flowing water. So the combination of the physical evidence, the, the morphologic evidence, and the chemical evidence was consistent with the presence of near surface water, the persistence of near surface water at the Meridius, Meridiani site. Obviously that was an exciting thing, uh, but the only trouble with Eagle Crater is it's rather small and we could only see that little tiny half of a, a meter of rock and of course the story about geologists is that the best geologist is the one who has seen the most rocks and so therefore we need to see more rocks and for that we need to go to bigger and bigger craters. And that has pretty much been the strategy of opportunity all along. Besides doing traverses to see if the rock has changed as we drive along, and you can see uh, this is a kilometer scale bar. This is many times longer than we had promised the world before the mission we would drive, but it has the advantage of making sure that our observations here really do rel are relevant on a broader scale as we can drive along. But also by going into craters, we can explore at a vertical dimension. We can say, okay, this is what happened at the time that layer was put down, but what about older layers? Uh, what kind of a story do they tell? And of course, going to Endurance Crater, and here you, is a tract showing Eagle Crater at the horizon. This line represents where the rover drove around the rim of Endurance Crater, stopped where you see this picture taken, and it shoots right back towards where it came from. We looked at here and he said, geez, we really want to get down into this crater because we want to look at these layers of rock and we finally decided to go back to a place called Caratepe, go down in and analyze the layers of rock down within the crater. What we found was more of the material like we saw at Eagle Crater, but we also saw a very flat laminated material of a different texture, and then underneath that we found large cross bedding consistent with sand dune deposits. And so when we sort of draw a model of this, we see an environment that had a lot of sand dunes in it, then it had areas of wet sand, that were perhaps down between the sand dunes and that places you actually had standing bodies of water like what we call Playa Lakes. And so this is an environment that's generally dry by earth standards but one that has near surface water and has occasional Playa Lakes, which by the way were the source of the evaporating fluids that gave rise to the sulfate rich minerals that we see within this rock. So it's probably an austere environment by our standards but potentially a habitable environment and certainly one that's a lot more exciting for life than, than the surface environment of Mars today. So you can see that by going to a crater that's about 14 meters deep, uh, we've learned a lot more about the context of our initial observation. And then of course, by looking again at this detail, uh, and here is a grinding into the surface of that rock outcrop showing um, <coughs> some of the fine textures that we see there, we begin to infer a history of how water has interacted with the sediment. First you have the lake that evaporated to form these sulfate minerals, but then you had a later phase of wetting after that lake dried up. You had a later phase of groundwater intrusion coming up, causing these little hematite spherules to form. <clears throat> a later stage of water activity, and then perhaps even a later stage where some of these minerals were dissolved away, uh, giving rise to the composite texture that you see here. So this is sort of how we do geology. We look at the various features within the rock. We infer a sequence of events from that, and from that can infer a bit of a history. And again, the persistent message here is one of near surface water expressing itself in various ways uh, in the rock fabric. When we drove to Endurance, uh, to Victoria Crater, which was a several kilometer drive, uh, we basically found a consistent story with this. Here is actually now one of the first images of this site taken by the high rise camera which was launched with the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter mission in 2000 and, 
and five, and it just shows how, again, the improved observations from orbit are beginning to, are continuing to benefit our surface exploration. The camera, the high-rise camera is so good that it can look at this spot right here from orbit at the same resolution that the, that the opportunity can look at it from about 600 meters away. So this shows you the power of the high-rise camera, and again, people here at SETI Institute are involved with that mission, and that's been a very valuable feedback on, on how we've done exploration of this site. And what we see is we drove along the rim of that crater, again, is uh, cross-bedded sandstones, but that have been substantially modified by groundwater, near-surface groundwater, that have caused textural and mineralogic changes. Again, a story consistent with what we saw earlier, near, persistent near-surface groundwater. Now, what's interesting is, is Andrews, Hannah, and others have come up with sort of a global model now for the hydrology of Mars, where you have generally this notion of of water from the southern highlands flowing into the northern lowlands and as a function of that the water table has various depths depending on where you are. In the southern highlands uh, this shows the water table being quite deep on this order of several kilometers in these areas in the southern highlands here where you see the blue but then when you get into the northern lowlands the water table is much closer to the surface as shown by these green colors here. If you do this transect here going through Meridiani, I might add, from A to B. You're going from the southern highlands to the northern lowlands. That's this elevation representation that you see here. Going along the transect, this is elevation here. You can see that in the southern highlands, the water, groundwater is quite deep, but they predict that in the area of Meridiani, the groundwater actually intersects the surface. And that would be consistent with groundwater coming to the surface at the Opportunity Landing Site, evaporating, and depositing soluble salts, which is basically what he predicts here. He predicts that given these groundwater flows, the evaporation of water should be focused in the areas that you see that are in red here, so that as you move into the slopes going into the, southern, the northern lowlands and in the northern lowlands, he would predict large amounts of evaporating water on the order of kilometers of water uh, in these particular areas. Now what's interesting is that in some of these areas where he predicts a lot of evaporation is where we have now have observed uh, salty evaporite type deposits, deposits of salt from water that came to the surface and evaporated. And of course one of these happens to be at Meridiani. So now we're beginning to understand a little bit more about why we see the features that we saw at Meridiani. And it speaks again to a global hydrologic cycle that was really quite significant several billion years ago. Now one of the wrinkles about this with life is that if water evaporates to a certain point with salt in it, it gets so salty that life really can't be metabolically active. So just that because we found water here doesn't necessarily mean it was habitable. If it was really, really salty, it might still be a problem for life. And this really gives rise to the key question of, well, what really are all the factors that we need to consider with respect to habitability uh, when we look at Mars? And in a way, the exploration that we did with the Spirit rover has gone further in addressing the complexity of this question uh, than was the case with Opportunity. And with that, I'd just introduce you to the Gusev site with a, an artist from the G National Geographic Society sort of representing what we thought that this crater might have looked like some four billion years ago. And that is Ma'adim Vallis being active, a ponded lake within the crater, and then of course water overtopping the crater rim and flowing off into the northern lowlands. And of course Apollinaris patera might have been, was probably active at that time and it, it made, making its contributions to the crater as well. So this was sort of the model that allowed us to, that made us select Gusev. The reality, of course, when we landed was not nearly as, as uh, you know, promising as we had hoped it would be, and it certainly wasn't initially as promising as what opportunity discovered on the other side of the planet. What we saw was, of course, lava, basalt, as I said, most of the Martian surface is lava rock that was uh, for the product of volcanic activity, we see evidence, of course, of aeolian activity, sand being blown around, dust devils, all that kind of thing. Um, and, of course, this is all broken up by meteorite impacts. So dominant processes, volcanism, meteorite impacts, and aeolian activity are very much in evidence of what we saw initially at the Gusev site. Our little great hope, though, were these little hills off to the east called the Columbia Hills. And we decided that having characterized the lava rock here, that it was appropriate to drive over there. And here now represents where we landed. These are what we call the basaltic plains. And we decided to drive over these hills because they just looked different. And also, if you look carefully, 
you'll see what looks like a sort of a shoreline feature here. This is the edge of the lava flows. They, they were erupted out here, they flowed across the surface, but they terminated right at the margin of these hills. And so here is the prospect for perhaps some older deposits telling us a little bit more about water than these lava rocks out here, which were Hesperian in age, we would say typically younger than about maybe three and a half to three billion years ago, whereas this material might be older and might speak more to the activity of water that occurred uh, back at that time. And now this is a chance where I'd like to just talk a little bit more about the astrobiology approach to Mars exploration, because I think in some ways what I'm showing on here, we've been able to begin to address more thoroughly uh, at this Gusev site. So let me just start with, there's three objectives. The first one relates to past life and past habitability. And under, those, under that first objective, uh, there are three major thrusts. Characterize the prior habitability of environments with a focus on resolving more from less habitable sites. And here's the key point. The geologic context of what was at the site, the availability of water, what kind of energy might have been available for life that could have been there, and what kind of chemical ingredients are available. And of course, the environment which would allow this water to be in a liquid form. All of these things are very important aspects of habitability. And this idea of water availability is related to that salty water problem that I talked about. It's one thing to have water, but it has to be dilute enough that life can actually use it for its biological processes. So this is one big question. The other one is, well, it's, it's, it's nice that the place was habitable, but did it preserve anything? Did you, did you preserve any evidence that there was life there or did it get destroyed uh, by processes that would break down what we call biosignatures in the subsequent history of the planet? And then of course the punchline down here is can you actually see any direct evidence of life itself? So is the, was the place habitable? Was there any chance that it preserved a record of that habitability and, or life? And of course, was there evidence of life? So these are now the, the key steps that we have to address in order to really ask the life question at any one of these landing sites. So here, let me just hit the habitability thing again, and that is to say you have to deal with the water availability. Was there energy for life that was available to that life at the same time the water was available? And of course, were there ingredients available, the various nutrients uh, that are essential for building cellular material? So the key, one key point is that they all have to be present simultaneously, obviously, for life to be able to uh, propagate. And the other key point is that they inter these, these factors interact with each other. If you have more favorable conditions with respect to water, you could tolerate maybe more extremes in energy or nutrient availability than if your water availability was quite limited. So these are very synergistic. They interact with each other. And somehow we have to be able to apply these types of considerations as we explore the surface of Mars. And I would argue that we're sort of making a start at this with what we have found at the Spirit site. Here now shows Spirit. Uh, this is obviously an artist plopping the rover in there. It can't take a picture of itself. But anyway, that's what it would look like if it were on the hillside of Husband Hill. And these are some very important outcrops. Uh, it's a place that, uh, called Cumberland Ridge. And within those outcrops, we found a very interesting distribution of the various elements. Now, there's one fascinating instrument called the Alpha Particle X-ray Spectrometer on the, on the rover that is able to analyze all these different elements that you see within rocks or soils. The key part of this diagram is that we're plotting abundances of elements relative to the abundance of the elements in a, in, a, in a basalt. In other words, all that lava rock sitting out on the plains, if you plotted that up on this scale, it would plot right on this solid line here. So all these lines that you see jumping around here for the various elements represent departures from a basaltic composition, okay, in various rocks that we analyzed on Husband Hill. And so the key point is, is that we have good reason to believe that these rocks started out life as basalts and then something happened to them. Something happened that changed their composition and there are some interesting patterns here. We tend to see an evidence of addition of sulfur and chlorine. Okay, well guess what? These can come in as, as dissolved in water so they could be added to the rocks. We also see evidence in some rocks of a weathering and removal of stuff that leads to an excess of aluminum oxide. Well, that's very reminiscent of what you see in soil weathering on the Earth where water's involved. But my point is, is that the departures that we see represent the, mobile, the alteration and mobilization of elements from these rocks by water. And this was, of course, a huge difference from what we saw in the basaltic plains. And it supported the idea that these hills 
have, are remembering an earlier history of Mars that had much more activity of liquid water. So this for us was a major discovery uh, indicating that this was a very important region to continue our exploration. Another key observation that we made within these same rocks, this is a basalt out on the plains, these are rocks that we saw on the hills, was that the fraction of iron that is in the oxidized state increased dramatically on the, in the rocks that were in the hills. Here in the basaltic plains, only 0.1 or 10% of the iron was in the oxidized phase, a plus three state, whereas as we looked at the rocks on the hills, the 56% in this case, or 83% of the iron in this rock was, has been oxidized. So at the same time these rocks have been altered by water, the iron has been oxidized. Now this addresses another important aspect of habitability. You not only have to provide liquid water to life, you need to give it an energy source. And microbes are very good at doing what we call oxidation reduction reactions to, to extract energy. And the punchline here is that it's a chemical source of energy for life. They don't need to do photosynthesis to live if they can do this kind of, of these kinds of reactions. If they can react something like you see up here with something like we see down here, they can get energy from that. So even though we have not shown that liquid water at Gusev was that necessarily at the surface, just being able to show that liquid water coexists in, with reactions that are causing oxidation re reduction transformations in itself is a candidate for a habitable environment. That could have been in the subsurface, but if you're doing oxidation reduction reactions and you got liquid water, you've got evidence on the earth, you've got examples on the earth of microbes that can survive in that type of environment. This makes a very key point, and that is that we really need to analyze minerals in our missions comprehensively to do assessments such as this. How much energy was available and therefore what's the prospect for this having been a habitable site? These circles, by the way, indicate places where we've already identified these features on Mars. This dash circles indicate where there's been a, a report of, of, a, of, a, of a gas and if it's confirmed, of course, it makes it even more exciting. This is in the Allen Hills meteorite, the famous one, and this, of course, is the atmospheric methane observation by MoMA and others. So again, you, we see uh, a lot of circumstantial evidence that this could be a habitable environment. As if that's not enough, here we were climbing along, going along the plains, climbed up onto Husband Hill. We decided to go down into a place called Inner Basin, and down in Inner Basin is a place called Home Plate. And what you're going to see in the next image is what we saw looking from here down to here, which is a distance of about 0.9 kilometers. Uh, this turned out to be a very interesting feature that basically made us decide to go down and visit it. This is what it looks like from that vantage point up on Husband Hill, but it's just what you would see in, if you had infrared eyes, eyes that could see the infrared, uh, and that is a, a pancake-shaped structure about 90 meters across, a couple of meters high, that showed an interesting compositional gradation from the northwest to the southeast. So something is happening down here that attracted our attention, and we thought, wow, just given the shape of this thing and, and these features, let's, let's go down and take a look. And when we got down there, we found, looking at the layers of rock uh, that comprised this sort of pancake shape is that this was a that this deposit was formed as, as, as part of a, a volcanic a violent explosion volcanic eruption of some type you have what we call base surge deposits very coarse grain sort of crudely sorted materials in a layered fashion evidence of a rock that actually was blown up in the air and hit the sediment and caused deformation this is most commonly seen where you see wet sediment being hit by these bombs set by these uh, volcanic bombs and then the upper level of this thing showed finer grain deposits that were basically pyroclastic type deposits. In other words, uh, ash thrown out into the atmosphere like that Icelandic volcano and then settling down and being reworked a bit by the wind. So this was just reeking of a, evidence of a, of a vo violent volcanic explosion uh, as a source of the material making up home plate. But as we started to analyze the elements within this, we found patterns that were consistent with hydrothermal activity. In other words, that maybe water was also involved at high temperatures. All very exciting, but of course the real punchline comes when you look that for direct evidence of, of water and volatiles interacting. First of all, evidence for water in the volcanic eruption itself, the vesicular basalt having a sponge-like texture due to the exolving water during the eruptive process. Uh, we found evidence of, of deposits here, these white and yellow deposits that are over 50% sulfate, soluble sulfate minerals, most significantly ferric sulfate, which is very soluble in water and indicates very acidic conditions. So this would be consistent with a hydrothermal fluid that's very, almost fumarolic in, in its activity. 
And then, of course, most exciting was the discovery of pure silica deposits surrounding this like a moat around the outside on three sides of, of home plate. And that's consistent with extensive mobilization of elements by hot water, either to leave a, a residuum de deposit that's very rich in silica or to have silica depositing out of this hot water like you see at Yellowstone National Park. And of course that leads me to the next slide and that is that everything we see at home plate is consistent with an environment like we might infer from a place at Yellowstone Park. And we wrote, Malcolm Walder and I wrote a paper several years ago saying, wow, a place like this would be a great place to visit uh, to search for life on Mars because it's a source of near-surface water. Uh, there's reduced chemical species associated with a volcanism that could be sources of energy for life, like that comment I made a few slides ago about redox reactions. You're forming mineral deposits which could preserve evidence of environments and life. So this addresses this question of preservation. You're forming minerals that could capture evidence and preserve it. And of course, just a range of conditions that could survive, could sustain a variety of biota. Uh, and of course, the punchline here is that we may have already found evidence of such deposits. And that's the question here. If we really now found a hot spring deposit on, <coughs> on Mars in the, at Gusev, and as if that's not enough, Recently, within Science Magazine or Science Express, uh, Dick Morris and others have now looked back at data that we collected two, three years ago and found that this outcrop called Comanche, which we, that, we drove past this thing down the hill to, to home plate, uh, actually it can, contains anywhere from 16 to 30 percent, 34 percent carbonate. And it's an iron magnesium type carbonate, totally consistent with what we'd expect by altering the volcanic rock to form it and it's a, it's a huge concentration of this carbonate. And the other key point I want to make about this was that the conclusive uh, detection of this required three different instruments on the Mars rovers. The uh, Mussbauer instrument, which made the primary identification, but also a consistency check with the thermal emission spectrometer, the mini-test instrument, and also the alpha particle x-ray spectrometer instrument. Those three instruments together collectively give a definitive interpretation of this as being a carbonate deposit. Again, showing the value of a science payload in, in your exploration on the surface of Mars. So again, one leading idea is that this could be a pipe of a hot spring system where the carbonate coming up in the fluid is being deposited as, as that fluid is delivered to the surface, again consistent with a kind of environment which on Earth could support life. So already in this initial sort of cycle that I described for you of the Mars Global Surveyor and some initial work by the MRO mission and then these two landers shows that we've really made, made a lot of progress beyond what we're, our, our view of Mars was at, at the time of the Viking mission. And I just want to say that the MRO, the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, is still alive and well and making great observations and it's opening the chapter for the next major phase of Mars exploration. For one thing, that high-rise camera has given wonderful ground uh, imagery, and it's given rise to this uh, model such as this one here. This just got published or presented at the last Lunar and Planetary Science Conference, of very dense channeled uh, uh, drainage networks that seem to be fringing the northern, uh, the, the northern lowlands. In other words, it's in the southern highlands, but right along the margin of the northern lowlands. The only place where you don't see it is, is where this huge volcanic province has put down lavas that are probably younger than the time at which these channels were formed. This is totally consistent with a very dependable supply of water in the northern lowlands and frankly it's consistent with the northern ocean existing at some time or at least a lot of water available in the northern lowlands to give rise to the precipitation that formed these much more densely spaced uh, drainage networks. Some of these densities, the ones that you see shown in, in orange here, uh, are, pro are overlap with densities that we see on the Earth. So we no longer have this notion that drainage networks on Mars are significantly uh, thinner than, than the ones that we see on the Earth. This again is attributable to a combination of better imagery now, but also better geomorphologic modeling of channel densities and statistics. So again, sort of the modern phase of Mars exploration. Also, a lot of work done by folks here at SETI Institute involved with the, um, with the MRO CRISM instrument and also the uh, Mars Express Omega instrument are beginning with infrared eyeballs to pick out of these outcrops, such as at Marth Vallis, clay minerals. Uh, not only just the presence of clay minerals, but the presence of different types of clay minerals, some of which speak to a rather extensive alteration of the rock, again, implying more and more water over more extended periods of time. 
And I won't spend much more time on these observations because you've probably heard about them uh, from the uh, PIs here at the SETI Institute. But I just want to say that when you look now at the aggregate of observations between what we've seen with the cameras and what we've inferred with our spectrometers, we see now that in this early phase of, of Mars history, this would be the, from four and a half billion years ago down to about 3.6 or so perhaps, a whole variety of types of environments all involving liquid water. Uh, deep clays, deep clays buried in deep layers consistent at least with groundwater being present, carbonate deposits, and I didn't even mention all of the ones that have been found, uh, clay minerals in, in, in fluvial type features such as alluvial fans and, and delta type deposits, deposits of soluble salts as I've mentioned, all these different types of environments. Now we have a, almost an embarrassment of riches of evidence about liquid water being present on the early surface of Mars and then very much becoming dramatically less abundant. Uh, so this evidence of a real climatic change occurring perhaps right around this period of time giving rise to the more familiar modern uh, Mars that we, that we see today. So my point is if, is if all you do is follow the water uh, how are you going to choose which of these places to go to? And this is where now astrobiology plays a role by applying a more stringent filter to these places to say which ones are really the best ones suited to search for evidence of life. Now we're beginning to make a step in that direction now with the Mars Science Laboratory mission. This is another artist sort of plopping the Mars Science Laboratory down next to the Spirit rover here to show you how much bigger this new rover is, but with that larger size comes a greater range of mobility and also the presence of an X-ray diffraction instrument, the Kemen instrument, and also the SAM instrument, which is a mass spectrometer that can analyze organic matter so that we now are going to do a much more comprehensive analysis of the samples that we see there and of course address those samples really in the context of these key objectives. Uh, what can we say about the geologic context, the amount of water that was present, the energy and the elements that were available and were they all available at the same time at this particular place? What kinds of minerals might be present that could preserve evidence of this environment and of course could preserve also evidence of, of biosignatures and so we really want to search for evidence of life in places where there was a high potential for habitability as well as biosignatures and so the Mars Science Laboratory mission is going to really explore further the appropriate approach at a place that's potentially quite exciting. Here now are the quite exciting places that are the final four candidates for the MSL rover. A place that looks very much like Gusev in the sense of a, of a crater that has a big stream running into it but because of our superior observations from orbit now, we can say there's not a big lava flow on this bottom of Holden Crater. That was, we see phyllosilicate minerals down there. We, we know, sort of like we did at Meridiani, that when we land, we will be able to drive up to the deposits that show us those clay minerals and show us those other minerals that are interesting. Likewise, that's true for all of these other sites, Eberswalde, Gale, and Marth. We now know from our observations from orbit that the minerals related to water are going to be present at the surface. So the big question is, which, four, which of these four places do we go to? It becomes a matter of degree. What's the, what's the diversity of interesting deposits? You know, how abundant are they? You know, how much water do they really tell us was there and how, for how long? And so in that sense, uh, we have to use this requirement for habitability at a more stringent level. You know, what are the chances that the raw materials were there? Uh, what can we say about the oxidized and reduced minerals and other sources of potential energy that might have been available? If the water was standing at the surface, then of course we get to use light as an energy source. And that's why uh, having water at the surface is a very important thing. Uh, obviously the presence and persistence of water and how, how fresh that water was. Was it as salty as we see at opportunity or was it something we can say that said that this water was fresher at the time it was present? Uh, and of course the conditions themselves. What, could, what can we say about the acidity or the temperature at the time all this was done? And of course it's this little intersection in the middle that's the habitable area. When all, it's just sort of like um, you know, Goldilocks and the Three Bears. If everything's just right, you, you're in the habitable zone there and those are the kinds of places we want to focus on. And that really then sets the stage for what we really would like to uh, address in the next decade of Mars exploration. And that is to say we have a continuing orbiters uh, program, although this is going to look more, MAVEN is going to look more at atmospheric escape processes, but the trace gas mapper is going to pursue 
the composition of the Martian atmosphere in a far greater detail than we have in the past, with the inference for trying to use that measure, those measurements for understanding the processes at and below the surface of Mars. Clearly, the recent discovery of methane in the atmosphere it relates to this, but it's not just methane that that's going to look for. It's going to look for other gases as well. So in a way, you might argue that this is more of a search for extant life on Mars in the sense that it's looking for gases that are actively being produced by potentially a, a habitable environment someplace and potentially even by life someplace. So this maybe begin, represents the opening chapter of another major objective in the life goal, and that is searching for extant life. But then we go back to the surface, and now we set the stage in returning to the surface for potential sample return. So given everything that we've learned now, what should be the approach that we take as we, as we go to the surface? Well, clearly we want to have a rover that can collect samples, and we will then try to get that sample back by a series of missions that would happen after that period of time. But with respect to that key rover, there are a number of key findings that the Mars Exploration <coughs> Program Analysis Group has come up with. And that is to say we, we're not just going to go there to search for evidence of life. When we go back to the surface, and, and bring back a sample, we need to pursue more than just the life-related objective. We need to pursue those other major goals as well, at least one additional one, like a geologic or a climate one. In other words, a broader base of observation, not just because we want to satisfy various, various scientific constituencies, but because we need that contextual information to interpret the habitability and the suitability of that site for having supported life. The other key thing is that the rover has to provide, uh, has to select samples intelligently. We, just as I showed you, we can look at lava rock or we can look at samples that might have been from a hydrothermal spring. And for that, we need to do certain analyses uh, to establish that we've really got the best samples. And of course, uh, this over spatial scales, the ability to do orbital observations, do orb observations with cameras on the rover, and then to finally zoom up close with analyses. These are all important aspects of intelligent sample selection. The key point then is that even if we didn't bring back the sample, this would be an important mission going to a new place. In other words, there's very important in situ science that we can do, uh, such as we've done with the Mars rovers, because as I showed you, there's all these different exciting diverse places that might have supported life. They're really different from each other. There's all different kinds. And so any rover that goes to surface, the surface with some instruments is going to make an important scientific contribution. Well, that type of contribution is the same kind of thing you want to be doing anyway to select the samples for return. So therefore, that 2018 rover that goes to the surface should be able to do science in situ and also to be able to collect samples for return. And of course, the other key point is that the way it collects those samples is that it has to be collected in what we call sample suites. And the best example, whoa, the best example I can give you of suites is the set of samples that we took going down into Endurance Crater, which I talked about earlier, that enable us to establish that we had Playa Lakes, wet sand, and dune deposits, and also to establish at depth that groundwater had intruded in and altered these things subsequently. So because we took a set of samples, or a suite of samples in a very organized way, we were able to say a lot more about what happened at this site. And so this rover needs to collect these suites of samples to really provide that broader context of interpretation. So this is what the rover would look like. We call it MAX-C for Mars Astrobiology Explorer-Cacher. So it's not only doing surface exploration for astrobiology, but it's also caching samples. Dual purpose, in situ science, and make definitive steps towards sample return. The key point is that it's very much a MER-like rover. It's much closer in size to the Mars rovers than it is to the Mars Science Laboratory. You can see the payload here, a total of science instruments and, and support, science support of 21 kilometers, kilograms for MER. It's 65 for MAC-C, but look at MSL. MSL is sitting up here at 237 kilograms, a much more substantial rover than the one that's being envisioned for MAC-C. But this then, perhaps, then really opens the door for uh, following up on all that we've learned about Mars with respect to the sites to go to and the types of observations to be made, and then very carefully selecting samples for a return. And of course, the point of this is to try to approach at Mars what we have already done on the Earth and study of our early biosphere on the Earth. And that is by analyzing carefully selected suites of samples from key localities. We've been able to piece together an image of early Earth 
which has much more profuse volcanism and, and, and impacts, as evidenced by Don Lowe's talk here a few weeks ago, uh, and also standing bodies of water, ther hydrothermal activities, which on Earth, of course, were very important for sustaining early life. The question is, how close can we come to painting an accurate picture for this on Mars? And if we can do that, it's really exciting for the following reason, and that is, the early history of, of the environment on Mars is probably better preserved than the early history of, of Earth's environment has been preserved on the Earth. Here's sort of an interesting schematic diagram showing the range of environments, environmental conditions that would support life. And here's depth within the crust. And of course the interesting thing here is that single-celled organisms can tolerate a much wider range of conditions and depths uh, than plants and animals can. So you might say that we're sort of nestled in this context provided by single-celled organisms on the Earth. But as you go back in geologic time, of course, the geologic record of single-celled organisms extends much further back in the record than the record of plants and animals. But what's so frustrating is that this, the ultimate limit to our record is not limited by whether life was there or not. It's limited by the quality of the geologic record. In other words, it's limited by the preservation of the rocks on the early Earth. So early Earth supports us today in, in grand style, but that's because it's geologically active. That same geologic activity has destroyed the earliest record of the environment on the Earth. On Mars, we have good reason to believe that that earliest record is still there. It's still preserved. It could potentially fill in a very important gap in understanding prebiotic chemistry and the origin of life that is just simply no longer accessible in the geologic record of Earth. And so you give that possibility together with the powers of observation that will continue to improve, and I can promise you that we're looking forward to even more compelling tomorrows than what the rovers have provided us so far. Thank you. So I'm certainly open to questions. It's the amount of time you want to dedicate. Yeah. One thing that I don't think I heard was time. How long, over what periods was liquid water available? Evaporative processes, I think, are rather rapid, I, generally. And uh, yeah, I guess well, it's it, a long time for life to evolve. But uh, time, what, what, what sorts of uh, estimates of the, the lengths of time that liquid water would be available are, are, are in fact, available from your models? Well, I think, uh, yeah, that, that, that of course is a key question. It's, it's, the L, it's, an L, it's, an, it's an aspect of habitability that is very centrally important. Uh, I'm trying to get to this slide here. You know, and that is this notion of, you know, drawing these things as crossing, you know, going this way a bit. Um, and, you know, as, as long as we cannot date things, we can't get rocks and do age dates, send them in laboratories like we've obviously done on the Earth. Um, you know, there's, there's a degree of uncertainty there. So what you do is you, you, know, you look at the extent of these deposits in terms of geographic extent. You try to do stratigraphy and you, you ask questions, well, how could we link these water-rich deposits to other deposits around which we could make some inference about how long it would have taken for these things to be deposited? And um, one of the course contexts that people try to provide is these are cratering densities because more heavily cratered surfaces generally are older than craters that are less dense. But as you probably know, there's a lot of problems associated with this method of, of dating. But it certainly is, certainly where you see these types of deposits, you're, you're dealing with the most heavily cratered areas. And uh, given that, the, that these deposits do span a range of crater densities, that would imply that there's a range of ages associated with them. But you know, this is all very qualitative, uncertainties on the orders of hundreds of millions of years. That's why we got to get the samples back. Either that or come up with an in situ method of doing age dating. Yeah, Janice. I wanted to ask you. I wanted to ask you about your current thinking about the possibility of an ocean in the northern lowlands. And as you know, this has been treated with some skepticism, but you alluded to it here. So I thought perhaps you could summarize some of the current thinking and why it m might be possible. You know, quite frankly, I think the, the, the biggest argument against it would come from somebody like Brian Toon, who just says it's just darn hard to keep a planet that small warm for long enough to where you could see there being an ocean. <clears throat> so, the, you know, the climate modelers are the, probably the biggest devil's advocates, you know, because they just have a hard time keeping Mars warm enough to do that. Um, and, you know, the whole problem with CO2, CO2 would be a great greenhouse gas, but at some point, 
if you build it up to where you need to have enough to make that greenhouse, it starts forming CO2 clouds and, and you get a feedback on that. So they're the real skeptics. But on the, uh, you know, while these skeptics uh, hold forth, you've got other things like this one, which I didn't show, and that is uh, geomorphologic analyses, not only of the stream channels, which I talked about earlier, which would be consistent with a global scale precipitation, but also the presence of deltas, which, and these, they interpret these to be large regional scale deltas that all line up at a very constant elevation across the surface, taking into account, of course, uplift at, at Tharsis and so forth. And these are different kinds of deltas than the ones that are shown here in blue, which are, tend to occur in the southern highlands. These guys tend to be more consistent with what you'd see, like, for example, on the Earth you know, on, on a, in a marine coastline. And they tend to line up very nicely, and that's consistent with a large body of water in the, in the northern lowlands. And, you know, I'm not a geomorphologist. I'm not, uh, you know, a person on either side of this dogfight <laughs> at this point. I just say, let's just keep the data coming. But I don't see anything at this point that rules out the possibility of a northern ocean. You know, but let, let the data flow in. Yeah. Dave, I heard recently uh, a comment that Sherrod, the shallow radar sounder on MRO, uh, had evidence for what was described as a buried glacier on Mars, uh, a few feet below the surface, extending to 45 degrees latitude. Could you tell us more about this? Well, yeah, I mean, the real contribution of these sounders has been uh, what they've done with ice deposits, because, as you know, uh, the, the, the radar penetrates ice very nicely. If you have layered structure within the ice, it stands out beautifully. So for signal-to-noise purposes, these, these radars are really telling us a lot of wonderful things. A lot of the wonderful stuff has come from the polar caps, but now I guess they're starting to spread out into these glacial uh, features that are elsewhere uh, on Mars. A, 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 a feature that's related to that is, is shown here, and that is all this water that's locked up, uh, the hydrogen, I should say, that's locked up at low latitudes that we just didn't expect. You know, there was this sort of clock running down idea about Mars climate that it was very wet, but ever since about three and a half billion years ago, it's just run down. And all the water has been removed from the equatorial areas and trapped into the poles and end of story. But this glacier observation, the fact that we're having an active glacier implies that there's been active deposition of water and then freezing it into ice in geologically recent time scales. Also, the degree of hydration of surface materials inferred by this hydrogen content at low latitudes also indicates that the modern climate regime may not be the whole story in terms of what's going on with Mars. And I think perhaps what's consistent with both the glacier observations and this is lies in the, high, in the obliquity variations of Mars. Uh, we're very used to thinking about a planet like Earth or Mars today, which is what, 22 degrees tilt of the spin axis with respect to the uh, ecliptic in the solar system. But, but now there's good, there's good evidence that Mars' spin axis has tipped over substantially to as much as 65 degrees. And when that happens, just imagine the seasonal change that occurs as you go from a northern winter to a northern summer. All that water vapor on one pole has to migrate to the other pole. And when it hits the terminator near the equator, you're going to have precipitation. And the models as to where the precipitation occur tend to overlap with observations of glacial features, like, for example, on the flanks of the large volcanoes and so forth. And so we're talking about a Mars at high obliquity that's really sort of different from the kind of Mars that we see today. And certainly, if you extend that back in time scales of million, hundreds of millions of years, there could be some really interesting stuff going on that might be consistent with uh, glacial observations and also observations of hydration state. Yeah. Um, did you mention that? Um the appearance of um, hematite particles was a strong indicator of water being present. If I recall, um, iron plus two is much more soluble in water than iron plus three salts. So wouldn't you expect to see ferrous oxide more on the surface or some degree of oxidation? What would be the reason for the oxidation? Well, uh, I think the key point is the, you know, ferrous iron is soluble over a range of pHs, but as you, um, if you make any ferric iron, uh, it becomes very insoluble at either neutral or alkaline pH. So the fact that we see ferric iron, yeah, it makes you, and, and that it's very concentrated, says, wow, you know, how could that be? How could, how could this iron have been mobile? Well, that has to be very low pH. Uh, and so a combination of, of low pH and liquid water explains how you get the ferric iron there. But yeah, you're right. Of course, ferrous iron is, is, is also quite soluble in water, but the problem with ferrous iron is that is oxidation. You, you have to be maintain reducing conditions uh, 
Um, and I guess you could have ferrous iron stay in solution at even low pH, but again, uh, you know, it, it, over these time scales, it'll probably uh, get oxidized. But yeah, that's, that's a key consideration, and, it, and, and it, it makes an interesting point, and that is that considerations about things like iron help us constrain pH environments. You know, how, how do minerals behave as a function of pH? Uh, and the fact that we can identify minerals really gives us a handle on what that environment, that environment was like and what, which model is most consistent with all the evidence that we can see. Yeah. Uh, Dave, <coughs> I, I got the microphone. Oh, uh, there you are. Two items. Yeah. Um, one is, as you present this, uh, there seems to be an assumption that uh, the devel development of life on Mars was native and there was possibly no transfer of life from Earth. I guess it depends on what your definition of a rose means. <laughs> but uh, I, I suspect that it doesn't matter when planning missions. You would plan the same missions to find uh, uh, <coughs> uh, right. panspermia delivered life as compared to native life. Uh, the other comment is that uh, the planning of the future missions seems to have no mission which is going to look for subsurface extant life. And I think that's kind of a shame if it's true, because uh, that would be a bombshell if you could find it underground. And I'm wondering if that's just an American thing, or the Europeans considering it, or is it really not on the table? Well, you know, that, that's, that's, I really appreciate you bringing that up, because I knew it would come up. And, uh, you know, the, the key thing here, here is now objective B, characterize present habitability and search for extant life. The way I would choose to address what you're saying is that we're really pursuing both objective A and objective B, but for objective B, which is the extant life, or current life thing, we're just phase shifted a little bit into the future. Uh, because you, you, you make the key point there, the best shot at extant life is subsurface extant life. And so our first attempt at that would be, well, in, in terms of future missions, would be, as I said, the 2016 orbital mission, where we're looking at trace gases and ask the question, do we need to invoke something in the subsurface to explain what we see in the atmosphere? So that gives us our first little hint. The second thing, though, that has to be done to address your point is geophysical experiments. The geophysicists have really been out in the cold here in the last few years. What they really want to do is seismology. They want to do heat flow. They want to do a lot of measurements of the interior that are very much uh, important for, for what you're talking about, and that is how do we approach exploring habitability in the subsurface of Mars, and, and we are so ignorant of the subsurface. Now, you've heard of the Europeans are saying, oh, well, we're going to explore the subsurface of Mars because we're going to put a two-meter drill down. Now, that's a little bit of a debate, I think, because in my opinion, two meters below the surface is at the surface, uh, certainly in terms of the temperature pressure regime for the stability of liquid water. Although, you know, there have been some interesting observations made by the recent Phoenix mission uh, that, that, you know, are, are merit consideration. But I think it's, it's just earlier days uh, in terms of that subsurface exploration just because of the access problem. And ultimately, of course, you want to drill down there. I mean, but wow, that's a human mission, <laughs> you know. You see the humans swarming all over any drill rig on the Earth, and you know that, you know, we're a few years off from being able to go down a kilometer in a robotic mission. So but we just need to get the technology better. Yeah. What, what about the uh, methane results of the caves? Okay, now, obviously I'm aware of the methane in the atmosphere, but now you mentioned the cave, the discovery of caves on Mars? Right, the, okay. And the fact that they looked at using Mars um, stimulant soils and um, blew up the phanogens from Earth on those. You've got the evidence there. Well, now, but when you talk about the caves on Mars, these little openings that were found, okay, because, you know, that's, either consistent with a lava tube or consistent with, you know, a, a, you know a, sometimes you have basically upthrust and downthrust crustal blocks, the downthrust block, well, you create cavities where you get collapses into this, what's called the Graben, Graben structure. I mean, you can, the point is, is that, you know, you, you, know, you need, don't need water for these things to form. And secondly, once you have that opening, you, you're basically at, at the surf, in under surface conditions with respect to temperature and pressure, which of course, again, is what determines the stability of liquid water. Um, I'm a little less familiar with where, what, where, what your angle is with these experiments that were done. But, you know, clearly microbes could live in, in fractured lava rock with water. And, and obviously if the rock is, has enough of a ferrous iron content, uh, you, could, you could actually do methanogenesis with the hydrogen that's being produced. So, you know, there's nothing that discounts it. But uh, anyway, that's my sense of the current status. 
Yeah. A related question about the, the caves seen from orbit that are largely taken to be lava tubes. Uh, and my question is, what, what's the utility for that, for looking at subsurface life conditions? Since you could, you don't know how far they go, you don't know how deep they are, and you can sample gases coming from the interior, and ultimately, in downstream, a human outpost would be naturally located near there, in there, because you'd have protection for radiation and uh, micrometeorites. So are these openings, the cave seen from orbit, are they located in interesting areas? You know, I really don't know the answer. I know that some of them are located in the places where you have extensive lava flows, and based on my comments about GUSEF, you can see that that wasn't the most exciting part of the mission for us. Uh, you know, a lot of the surface of Mars, um, tens of percent, is covered by these what we call Hesperian Age lava flows, uh, Wrinkle Ridge uh, provinces and so forth. <clears throat> and that's a great place to go to get an age date, because these things tend to occur, you know, they, we think they're sort of from the Middle Ages of Mars, which is our most poorly constrained part of the age scale. So it would be a great place to go uh, get a dated surface, but it's also probably as far as possible from some of these places where we see this extensive evidence of, of liquid water. Um, there's no doubt that, uh, that a cave or some way that you can use to protect yourself from radiation would be important for human exploration, but that said, you've just got to find, you've got to put your outpost in a place where you have access to water that's perhaps chemically bound but yet re retrievable from you know, some kind of a water-rich deposit like I showed with that one map. So that's a debate, you know, what's, what's the trade between your need for a certain water supply against your um, need to be protected from radiation? And, you know, this is a debate that we're going to have to have for the next several years. And, of course, the small matter of planetary protection, uh, are you going to put your human outpost next to a place where life on Mars might be persisting somehow? And that gets into a whole other set of issues. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I got a question back here. Um, we, we've, we've taken core samples of... Um, of like Antarctica and different ice places. Like, have we taken any core samples of the of the poles on Mars? And what has it told us about the maybe the past atmosphere of Mars? Because I know we use core samples from our Arctic poles to find out about the history of Earth, about the gases and stuff in Earth. Have we done that with Mars? Okay, so the question here is uh, sampling ice on Mars, uh -huh. uh, or uh, yeah. well, in particular the poles. At the poles, yeah. Okay. Well, um, the, when you look at the polar layer deposits, uh, what you see, at least in terms of the accessible surface layers, would be consistent with a, a, a climate regime that you know, geologically is relatively recent. Um, the time scales, for example, of these big obliquity variations I'm talking about are on the order of tens of millions of years. And so much of what we see as an ice-rich deposit on Mars probably scales to that age time scale. So, you know, you know, just in terms of the ice deposits, you're pretty much looking at the last several tens of millions, maybe 100 million years at the max. Uh, there's a residual polar cap that's underneath that almost looks like it's a residuum from pre-existing ice that uh, retains a layering because of the original ice layers were layered, but uh, that might punch you back further. But um, anyway, so that's, there's the time scale thing. Also, you know, you don't, you don't need to make polar caps with liquid water. I mean, you can go straight from ice to ga uh, solid or gas to you know, to solid and back again without invoking liquid water. Operationally, though, the, and, and, you know, and uh, Wendy Calvin, of course, is a big advocate of a polar mission where you go down and, and do that, and there's a lot of cool things you could say about climate, but it's, there's an operational problem. The time it would take to really good, do a good stratigraphic sample probably exceeds the length of a Martian spring, summer, and fall in, the, in, that, in that polar region. And uh, it's hard to imagine a spacecraft surviving a winter there. And so... We're going to have to come up with a mission. If we're going to do that, we put a core down or do a traverse across uh, layers, we're going to have to come up with a mission that either can figure out we can survive that winter, which you can imagine how hard that would be, uh, or just be able to do that mission fast. Boy, I don't know if I want to be on that operations working group. <laughs> Man, we've got to get this done in three months. Uh, so that, there's, a, there's a big challenge. And as long as we've got what we would call low-hanging fruit at low latitudes with the missions I discussed, uh, it's going to be a hard case to, to make, but that's part of the ongoing debate also. This is something that the climate people really want to do. And, uh, you know, enough determined people will find a way sooner or later. Well, I think we're going to cut the questions off there. I certainly encourage you to come up and speak with, uh, with Dave in person if you have any more questions to ask. Um, in appreciation for an oh. excellent talk, we have a SETI Institute pin. Well, thank and you. And join me in thanking the speaker again. Thank you.